following message is a presentation of Valley Metro Church, a community of believers dedicated to knowing God and making Him known. Is everybody doing good? I hope so. Come on, it's Christmas time. We wait a long time for this time of the year. How many look forward like big time to this time of the year? How many look forward? You know, what's interesting about it is when you're a kid, this is what I've noticed, just just my observation. When you were a kid, you are so looking forward to Christmas. Christmas is like you can't wait, like you're counting the time. I know my daughter's been saying how many more days. She's marking the calendar. She's looking all the time. Sometimes kids make the rings and they start tearing off days as they get closer. But this is what I've noticed is kids are looking forward to Christmas and parents spend more time preparing and getting ready. Have you noticed that? The, the, the kids have this anticipation and excitement. They're not preparing anything. They're just ready to enjoy it. But the adults flip into a mode of, oh, we got to do the Christmas cards. We've got to get the decorations. We've got to invite people. We've got to pack up. We've got to go places. We've got to do all these things. So the parents kind of get out of anticipation waiting mode, and they get into, oh, wow, i got a lot of stuff to do. Can anybody relate to that one? OK, there's something about the heart of a child. The child gets it. They're like, the main thing is Jesus, and he's coming, and it's his birthday, and it's a celebration, and it's epic, and I can't wait for it to happen. So anyway, I hope you are getting ready for Christmas. I hope you can't wait for Christmas. And today we're talking about specifically waiting, because there's things in your life that you are waiting for. There's things in your life that you've been asking God about. There's things in your life you've been praying for. There's things in your life that you want breakthrough for. It might be a matter of health or finances or job or a family member or something, something about your calling. Uh, There's something in your life probably that you're waiting for like most of us. And we're going to talk about that today because we're going to look at some waiting in Scripture. And it applies monumentally uh, to your life. And uh, we're going to be looking at a couple of passages today uh, about waiting. We're going to look at Galatians and Isaiah. In fact, if you want to turn to one of them, you could turn to uh, Galatians 4. And we're going to look at that one first. But speaking of waiting, um, there was these dads waiting in the, in the waiting room uh, for their children to be born. And all of a sudden, the uh, nurse comes out to the first dad and says, uh, sir, congratulations. You are the f- proud father of twins. And the guy's like, that's really odd because I work for the Minnesota Twins. And then the next nurse comes out and goes to the next guy, sir, you are the proud dad of triplets. Guy's like, that is crazy. I work for the 3M company. And so all of a sudden, the next nurse comes out and says, "Uh, sir, you are the proud father of quadruplets. He's like, that is wild. I work for the Four Seasons Hotel. And all of a sudden, they turn and look at the next guy, and he's banging his head against the wall. And they say, sir, what's wrong? He goes, I work for 7-Up. Yeah. Waiting room, waiting room. Some of you guys may have had that experience in the waiting room. Speaking of waiting, I remember our first child waiting. You know, wait, you wait for all your children, but the, the, the concept of a baby coming is the why. And the first child is always the, the it's the unknown, and you, you know, you're waiting forever. And you know a baby's growing, and a baby's growing, but there's no identity yet. And you're waiting forever for this baby to come. And it seems like forever. And then sometimes the pregnancy is really long or the delivery is really long. And you're waiting and waiting and waiting. And then finally, you get to hold this little gem and look back at their little face and their little fingers and all this really cool stuff. And it's always uh, worth the wait. Um, Some of you might be waiting to get married. That's a big season in people's lives, looking forward to getting married. Like, when is that going to be? Or who's the right one? And there's this... There's this waiting. I want to tell you the Greek word for wait suggests this leaning forward and pressing in. It's a proactive word. It's not a passive word for waiting. It's not waiting at Starbucks for your latte where you order a latte and you give them your name and you're on your phone uh, for a minute or two and you know, you're waiting for them to call your name. It's not a passive kind of waiting. In scripture, when it refers to waiting, both in the Hebrew and Greek, that the context is usually leaning in. Everybody say leaning in. It's leaning in while you wait. It's proactive. It's pressing forward while you wait. It's not kicking back and let's just see what happens. It's I expect and I hope, God, I'm waiting for you. And I'm still waiting for you to do something, God. But I'm not just going to check out. I'm going to lean 
in. I'm going to expect. I'm going to hope. And, and, and I'm, that, that's the context of waiting in Scripture. Uh, and maybe some of you are waiting for something in your life, something profound. And, and I trust many of you in this room are. I know we are as well. Some of you might be waiting for a child where you're saying, God, please. And, and you don't, you're not quitting. You're, you're leaning in as you hope and as you pray and as you expect. You, you lean in while you wait. That's the context in scripture. And, and some of you, maybe it's a matter of healing. You're praying for an area of healing uh, in your life or somebody that you love. And you're like, God, I know you can heal. I know you do that, God. I, I hope you do it in my life or his life or her life or their life. And, and you're leaning in, you're leaning in while you wait. And that's what the context is. I know we've been crying out for revival in our city. There's been historic revivals throughout history, even in our city, the city of angels. City of angels, supposed to be a city of God's messengers by name, by title, by definition. That is our city. And that's why we're ministering in the city, because we believe God wants to redeem our city, and he wants it to be a city of angels, a city of people who are so in love with Jesus that they're contagious, and that the love of Jesus spreads all over the city and redeems the city and redeems Hollywood. There's a lot, how many would say there's a lot to redeem in our city? There's a lot to redeem. I believe Jesus wants to redeem everything, and everything he touches, he redeems. Every life, every person, everything he touches, he redeems. And, and we're crying out for re, the redemption of our city. That's something we're leaning forward. We are waiting because we can't make it happen, but we want to partner with God, and we are leaning in in prayer and saying, God, we're not just checked out waiting for you to do so. We're leaning in. Our waiting leans forward. Uh, and, and this is an important topic because um, even as a pastor, I've spoken to many people, uh, even other ministers about this, and, and there's a general consensus that my, my colleagues, friends of mine that do ministry would all agree, uh, that many people tend to have a, a, a basic idea of their calling in life. Uh, many, not everybody, but many people tend to know, I think God wants me to do this. I, I think God made me to do this. I think God gave me these gifts, and I should use these gifts to make God smile, whatever that might be, whether it's athletics or design or whether it's worship or whatever it might be, teaching, administration, leadership, whatever your gift might be, the idea of saying, hey, I want to use my gift to make God smile. Many people tend to have some basic idea of their calling. However, the timing, the timing, I have yet to meet anyone who has the timing of God down. I've yet to meet anyone who's got God's timing down. Ministers, myself as well, and other ministers. The timing of God is something that's confusing to a lot of folks. They don't understand the timing of God. And you and I don't often understand the timing of God. And here's where the frustration can be. You sense God wants to do something. You sense God desires to do something. And yet, it's not happening yet. Has anybody ever felt that way? It's not happening yet. And herein can lie the frustration. And that's why it's so important for you and I to come to terms with this waiting on God, the timing on God, and what we do in the meantime. What do you do in the meantime while you're waiting for God? What do I do in the meantime? Because what we do in the meantime matters a lot. There's a lot of biblical examples of it. We're going to unpack a few today. Some really cool stuff going on uh, in Scripture. The cool thing about waiting is the, the greatest wait in the Bible was followed by the greatest gift in the Bible. The greatest wait was Israel waiting for their Messiah, Jesus Jesus, the Savior, who we celebrate on Christmas, they were waiting so long for Messiah. And the long wait was followed by the greatest gift. And sometimes the longer you wait, the more you appreciate the gift. The longer you wait, the, you, you can ask Abraham about that one. He's waiting for a son, waiting, waiting, waiting. When, God, am I ever going to have a son? When? And God gives him a son. He's like, yes, this is epic. This is Because the, the longer you wait, sometimes the more you appreciate the actual gift. Well, in the Bible, this is the case as well. So I want to encourage you to, to write down a few notes, whether it's on a bulletin or in your phone. Uh, we're going to look at some things. This will apply to your life regarding the timing of God and you waiting and what you do while you're waiting, your perspective on waiting for God. And the first one is this, is that God's promises are always worth the wait. God's promises are always worth the wait. And that's on every level. Like, okay, Lord, I want to be married. What should I do? Should I wait for you? And some people will wait and do it God's way. 
and watch what God does as we seek first the kingdom and he begins to merge lives together. It's beautiful. Other people, they're not going to wait. They're just going to go make something happen. And, and, and there's stories in the, in the Bible of people getting ahead of God and the timing, but, but the thing is, God's promises are always worth the wait. Whatever you're waiting for in your life that has to do with God, it is worth the wait. His promises are always worth the wait. So we're going to look at a couple of scriptures, and uh, the first one, if you have Galatians in your Bible or on your phone, uh, in the church app, there's the, the Bible app is in the church app, and you can open it up there, uh, Galatians chapter 4, you can open that up, and we can go there together this morning, um, Galatians 4, and this one I want to read out of the New Living Translation, because I like the way it's worded, but your, your translation will be pretty similar, uh, Galatians 4, verses 4 through 5, says this, But when the right time came, God sent his son. Born of a woman, subject to the law, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. This is a pretty profound verse right here. It's talking about God sending his son, Jesus, who we celebrate this birth at Christmas time. But but it's talking uh, not just about that. It's saying suddenly, basically, suddenly, suddenly. At the right time, at just the right time. And this is where you and I get really off on our timing and our waiting for God. We, we know he wants to do something. We sense he does. We, we might see it in scripture. We kind of feel in our lives he does, but this timing thing can mess with us. And we can get pretty tired and burned out sometimes waiting if we're honest about it. Because we're like, when God? When are you gonna do something? And this passage says, suddenly, at the right time. God changed everything, just as he promised he would. He's, he's been saying for years, Messiah's gonna come, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, and at the right time, boom, the Messiah came to Israel, and they were waiting for so long. Some of the translations say at the right time, other translations say at the set time, meaning the time according to God's economy was set. It was a date on a calendar at a time you and I don't know about but God does, and God had a set time for this to happen. Your birthday was a set time. Our termination date or our expert is a set time. These are things that we don't know any of these things. We don't know any of them, but God, the all-knowing sovereign one, does. At the, ex- at the right time, at a set time, some translations say at the fullness of time. Some translations say when the appropriate time had come, and here's the problem. You and I don't understand what appropriate is according to God. His ways are so much higher than ours, like the heavens are above the earth. He, his ways are so much higher, and, and we're saying, no, this is the appropriate time, and I get it, because we feel like it is. I mean, we really feel like it's the right time, and God's like, I hear you, but I'm doing something bigger. It's not the right time, and you, you'll understand why later, but the right time is coming. The right time, the set time, the fullness of time, the appropriate time, according to God. Here's the thing, guys. We don't We don't control the clock because we didn't create the clock. If we created the clock, we would get to control the clock. But we didn't control the clock. We we don't, I mean, we didn't create the clock, so we don't get to control the clock. The best thing we can do is manage the time that we have that God gives us. You know, there's a lot of football playoffs. Go Rams. Can I get an amen to that one? Go Rams. Okay, Rams playing today. They need your prayers. Um, uh, the point is this, um, part of the game, part of the strategy is managing the clock. They don't make the clock. They don't create the clock. They can't add more time to the clock. They can only manage the clock that they have. And good coaches know clock management. They're really good. They don't make more minutes. They don't create more time. They don't say, uh, you know, stop. Can you put 20 minutes back on the... No, it doesn't happen that way. You can only manage the clock you have. But we don't get to make the clock, so we don't control the clock. Our second point this morning is this, guys. This is an important one. As we wait, as we wait, trust that God is controlling the clock. You've got to trust that God's controlling the clock. He made it. He understands it better than we do. I know we're waiting, and sometimes we're impatient, and we're pressing in, and that's all good. We should lean in. Don't get passive in your waiting. Lean forward in your waiting for God. Yet at the same time, no, as you wait, as you wait, you have to know that God's controlling the clock. The clock is in his hands. 
Israel's waiting for Messiah. How long? Waiting, waiting, waiting. And finally, at the right time, at the fullness of time, at the appointed time, according to God, he came. And that is, that is the way his economy works. That's the way his, his kingdom works. So I want to ask you this this morning. I trust that you trust in God, and that's why you're here this morning. You're here this morning because you have a trust in God. You love God. You're open to God. You're willing to hear from God, be directed by God. I, I, I believe that you're here this morning because you, you trust God. But I want to ask you this. Do you also trust his timing? Do you also trust his timing? I know, uh, yes, in, if you're going to pick category, I don't trust God. I, do. I, I, I bet if I were to ask you all one-on-one, most of you would say, I, I I trust God or I'm learning to trust God and I want to trust God and yes, I'm in this category. That's beautiful. But do you trust his timing? Because part of trusting God is trusting his timing. You realize that? Part of trusting God is trusting also in his timing, that he's the sovereign one who controls the clock. He made the clock. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And this is important because as we're waiting we got to also trust in his clock management, really, with the clock. That's really important. In the right time, the scripture said the father sent his son. In the right time, he sent his son. Uh, and we went from being under the law uh, to being under his grace. We went from being slaves to the law, the Bible says, to being adopted as his children that he loves. This is beautiful. At the right time in history, everything changed. We went from people separated from God and under the law to, through what Jesus did on the cross, we went from that to being adopted as son and being forgiveness offered and under God's grace in the fullness of time when Jesus came. That's a pretty epic change. It's a monumental change to all humanity and Jesus, the Father sent the Son at that time. Again, we celebrate that at Christmas. At the right time, the star appeared in the sky for for the magi, for the wise men. At the right time, the star appeared and they said, it's time, let's go. At the right time, at the right, at the right time, the star appeared. It's time, let's go. Uh, the, the shepherds in the field, at the right time, the angels came to them and they said, it's time, let's go. Uh, not a moment sooner, not a moment later. In the fullness of time, God says, it's on, and we say, let's go, it's time. And we see this sequence happening through the Bible again and again. Here's the third point this morning. And this is, uh, if there's one that you remember today, if there's one that you take home, if there's one that you hide in your heart, I hope it's this one, because this is a scripture as well. And this one is, God makes everything beautiful in its time. And I'd like you to repeat that with me this morning. God makes everything beautiful in its time. Let's say it loud like we mean it. God makes everything beautiful in its time. This is important, guys. It's a season for everything under the sun, the Bible says, talking about the timing of God, the economy of God. And God makes everything beautiful in its time. And this is something that our human condition has a hard time digesting. It has a hard time accepting this part. We sense the will of God. We might sense direction. But the timing part, we get all off on that. Everyone does, oftentimes. And we have to understand that God makes everything beautiful in its time. God makes everything beautiful. I believe this is true. Scripture says it is. This is Ecclesiastes 3.11 that tells us this. God makes everything beautiful in its time. And if you are willing to hold on to that, you're going to do a lot better in your waiting for the Lord. When God's saying, just wait for it. You're not going to be passive. You're going to be leaning forward. Yet at the same time, as you lean forward, as you press in by faith and you're waiting on God, trusting he's good and trusting that he answers prayers, you're going to know at the same time that it is God who makes everything beautiful in its time. That's really important. And so uh, to, to really appreciate waiting, I know many of you in this room are waiting for things. We're waiting for things. I trust there's Many of you that are waiting for something, some kind of breakthrough, God to do something epic in your life or change something or bust something wide open or provision or healing or breakthrough or a job or a family, whatever it might be, you're waiting for breakthrough. But if you want to understand timing, one of the best ways to do it is to look at Israel because they know about waiting. They know about waiting in a way that we don't. And I think if we look at them really quick, I just want to share a a brief example of of Israel. We'll understand waiting uh, a whole lot more. In the Old Testament, um, Israel went through these times where they got to hear God's voice very directly. Uh, Sometimes it was often, and sometimes it was not so often. 
Uh, God would speak to Israel through the prophets and the seers, the prophets and the seers. And the way it worked through scripture, it would say in the, in the uh, prophets in the Bible, it would say the word of the Lord came to, prophets were hearing. The word of the Lord came to the prophet so-and-so in the year of the king this. And they would say, God spoke, the prophet would write it down and proclaim it to the people. So the revelation from God kept flowing through those who were hearing from God. And then others were seers. They were prophets that saw. Instead of hearing, they saw. And it would say, a vision from the Lord came to me, the prophet so-and-so, in the year of this king or this ruler or this captivity or whatever it might be. So some of them were hearing from God. Some of them were seeing visions from God. All of it were downloads from heaven on behalf of the people. They were recording this stuff and sharing it with the people. And sometimes in Israel's history, there were multiple prophets all at one time. In the time of Elijah, there were hundreds of other prophets. It's a crazy picture. There's hundreds, Elijah's like, am I the only one? God's like, uh, you have no idea. There's hundreds of other prophets you don't even know about. So all at the same time, there's hundreds, but in the time of Ezra, very few prophets in the land. So sometimes there's getting this great revelation, sometimes there's very minimal revelation, and this seems to be what's going on in the prophets. But when we look at the last prophet in the Bible, and he's an Italian one, and some of you didn't know we had an Italian prophet. He's a prophet called Malachi. You read him? He's the last book of the Old Testament. It's, no, it's Malachi, but you can call him Malachi if you want. If you're Italian, you can own him. Um, but, but here's the deal. He's the last prophet in the Old Testament. <laughs> uh, the, he's the last one. So, so, so he's getting this revelation from God. And by the way, his revelation is about John the Baptist. God's going to do something great, but he's going to send a messenger right before the Messiah comes. He's going to send one to prepare the way. And Malachi over here is writing about this. And then guess what? Silence. Silence. There's no noise. There's no sound. There's no download. There's no vision. There's no revelation from God for 400 long years. 400 long years. This is Israel who had multiple prophets at a time, sometimes, and only a few at other times, but they've gotten the revelation from God, they're encountering God, and now there's 400 long years of absolute silence. And they're waiting, and they're timing. They're trying to lead forward, but this is getting a little old to them. They're waiting, and they're waiting. Their parents waited, their grandparents waited, and everyone is waiting for this breakthrough, and they're waiting for Messiah, and they're waiting in silence. And I would suggest to you that the hardest type of waiting is waiting in silence. The hardest kind of waiting that you might have to wait in your life is waiting in silence where you don't hear God's voice. There are times when you hear God's voice and there's revelation and there's insight, but there's times when there's no insight. There's times where there's no revelation. There's times where there's no download. There's no new information. You're like God. Have you ever been at a time when you're waiting and you have not heard back from God? Can I get a show of hands? Okay, yeah, there's, there's times where God shows. He'll give a sign, he'll show you something. There'll be some kind of breakthrough or some indication. You're like, awesome, God, at least, at least I have that. At least I have this I can hang on to. I needed this, God. You know I needed some kind of indication. You gave me an indication, thank you. Maybe it was you were reading the word and he showed you something, a promise, and you're like, thank you. Maybe it was through a prayer time and he answered your prayer or a circumstance where you're like, God, I get it, the sign is clear. I'm waiting, but I can wait better now. I can wait better now because you gave me something. But the hardest kind of waiting is waiting in silence when you have nothing, nothing, and you're still waiting, and you got nothing. God, is that you? And this happens. This happens because it's in these times that God is stretching your faith. It, it's, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things unseen. I would also add it's the conviction of things unheard. You don't get to hear the answer and yet you still gotta walk in silence. The conviction of the unseen. I don't see it, but I'm walking it anyway. If you saw it, that would be proof. If you got to see everything, you would be walking by proof. You would be walking by sight. But if you don't get to see it, you're walking by faith. The same with hearing. If it's so clear to you, that's cool. It's a little bit of faith, but I kind of heard God's already said this. So you're walking towards it. But sometimes you don't have anything. You don't have the voice of God. You don't have that insight. And that's the hardest kind of waiting. So uh, the fourth point this morning is this, guys. When you are waiting in silence, when you're waiting in silence, hold on 
to the last thing that God did give you. Hold on. What is the last thing he did give you? You hold on to that. So when you're waiting in silence, what's the last thing God did tell you? What was his last instruction? What's the last thing in the word that stood out to you? What's the la- what is the last thing? Maybe you haven't heard from him in a while, but what's the last thing he did tell you? You hold on to that. You hold on to that all the way. You hold on to the last thing he gave you. There were times in the New Testament where these guys were like, God, what do we do? And they had a recall. They had a recall. Well, what did Jesus tell us to do? We don't know. We, we don't have a clear indication, right? We don't know. But what did Jesus tell us to do back then? And without a revelation or an insight, you got to hold on to the last thing God told you because that matters a lot. And what you do while you're waiting matters a lot. What you do while you're waiting matters so much, guys. It matters so much. When you look at Israel, for example, who were the king of waiters, I mean, these guys had to wait. Uh, We learned so much from them. In the time of Moses, Moses shows them this, the Caesar parted, radical things, manna from heaven, cool stuff's going on, water from a rock, all kinds of cool revelation. They're like, we get it, the God of Israel, we're following him, he's taking us out of bondage of Egypt, he's bringing us to a promised land, we get it, Moses, okay, we're all in, and we're following, and we're doing this stuff, and now Moses is like, okay, guys, I'll be right back, I'm going to go up on the hill, I'm going to meet with God, I'm going to get some extra revelation, I'll be right back, you guys, while I'm gone, honor God. Honor God, just keep your eyes on him. Can you do that? It's very simple. It's like children. I'm leaving. Can you guys just do this when I'm gone? Just, just, just honor God while I'm gone, okay? Yeah, sure, Moses, cool. And Moses goes up on the hill. And while they're waiting, they completely take their eyes off God. They start taking things in their own hands. And they say, well, what can we do to make something spiritual work instead? They start put, burning all their gold and making idols. They start going on a tangent and Moses comes down from the hill, is like, are you kidding me? Boom, and he breaks the commandments. Like, really, guys? Is that what you do while you're waiting? And I want to say that because there are well-intended believers that while they're waiting for God, they don't wait very well. We got to learn how to wait well. We got to learn how to keep our eyes on God. We got to learn how to wait God's way because what you do while you're waiting matters a whole lot. Israel didn't do that so well. So during Israel's 400 years of silence, they needed to look back on what God had told them. What should we do in this silence? We better hold on to what he did say, and that's where you want to be. Uh, G. Campbell Morgan puts it this way, in talking about waiting, and how you wait, how I wait, what are we supposed to do when we wait, how does that work for us while we're waiting on God? He says this, waiting for God is not laziness. Waiting for God is not going to sleep. Waiting for God is not the abandonment of effort. Waiting for God means first, activity under command. Second, readiness for any new command that may come. And third, the ability to do nothing until the command is given. In other words, if God isn't changing or giving you a new command, don't just go off and take it in your own hands and go, well, God's not showing up, I'm gonna do this. Bible's full of stories of people who go, I waited for God, I got to get my business done now. And they don't wait for God anymore. Saul, who was the king of Israel, the first king of Israel, this was, he kept striking out. And this is how he finally struck out of the game in being used by God and serving God. He's like, I'm not waiting anymore. Hmm. I'm not waiting for revelation. I'm not waiting for this. I'm not waiting for anything. If it doesn't show up, I got to make it happen on my own. God's like, wow, that is way beyond your pay grade, Saul. (laughs) You don't understand. You don't control the clock. And Saul's like, I don't care, I'm going to make it happen anyway. And we see the guy keep striking out. So the timing of God is really, really, really important. Um, Years ago, um, I was in Israel and went over there a few times. But on this trip, it was a pretty awesome trip. This trip was, uh, we were going over there and we're exploring. The word of God was coming alive. As you're going through Israel and you're, you know, you're reading these passages and, and you're looking at the passages in scripture and you're actually at the location where it happened. It's pretty cool. You're like Sermon on the Mount, you know, the garden tomb. It's pretty monumental. I encourage everyone in the room at some point, go to Israel, take your word, camp out with the Lord. It's profound, okay? It's a life changer. But on this particular trip, we wanted to really share Jesus with a lot of the Jewish people because you know the Jewish people are still waiting for Messiah. Do you guys know this? They're still waiting for Messiah. The difference between our faith and their faith is we know he came and they're still waiting for him. Now, it was one thing for the Jewish people to wait 400 years of silence. We know they had to do that. And then Jesus was born in a manger. 
But the sad thing is, they've been waiting 2,000 years too long. You guys realize that? Israel's been waiting 2,000 extra years. They did not need to wait because the Messiah already came. And scripture, even Old Testament scripture, is very clear on that. Very clear on who he is, where he's going to come from, what he's going to do. Anyone who's simply willing to look at their Old Testament scripture will find Jesus in the Old Testament. They will find where he's coming from, when he's going to come, how he's going to come. And you can't deny, wow, Jesus did check, 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 check. It's like 365 messianic scriptures of Jesus coming, and he's fulfilling all of them. So, um, we went over there, and we wanted to also share faith while we explored the Holy Land. And so we were uh, you know, sharing faith with different Jewish people and had amazing breakthrough of people saying, really, does it say that? And I can't believe it. And, um, one time, this is a really cool story, one time we were trying to get to a museum, and uh, we couldn't find it. You know, the streets are not like the valley. Nor they're like all curvy, every one of them. They're like all over the place, right? So we're, we're trying to figure out how to get to this museum. And we couldn't get there, and so we pull over and we ask this guy, and he's, a, he's an Orthodox Jewish guy, and he's walking out in the sun, and, and we said, hey, can you um, tell us where this thing is? He starts explaining, and he goes, you know, this is, this is very difficult. Maybe I will come in and show you. And we're like, awesome, thank you. So he jumps in the van, and, and, and he shows us where this is, but as we're going down this two-lane, like little freeway, if you will, uh, all of a sudden, there's an accident way up ahead, and it comes to a screeching stop, I mean, a complete halt. So here we are with this Orthodox Jewish guy, uh, and we are bumper to bumper stopped, literally to the point where we get to put it in park with the AC on in the middle of August, and has the swivel seats, and get to swivel the chair around right in the middle of the freeway. I'm like, God, this is awesome. You know, you hear about being fishers of men, but it's another thing when a fish jumps right in your boat, right? Whole nother thing. So I'm sitting, we're sitting here, and this guy's an Orthodox Jew, and and I'm like, hey, so let me ask you a question, buddy. Um, What do you think of... Messiah. The word is Mashiach for them. They say Mashiach, we say Messiah, which means Christ. Um, What do you think of Mashiach? He's like, I don't know, it's difficult. Maybe when he comes, you know, um, he's trying to explain. And then he says, you know, you must forgive me. He said, today is um, difficult for me. He said, today you see I am fasting, and I am fasting because this is the day of the celebration of uh, commemoration of Israel's temple being destroyed. 2,000 years ago on 70 AD. He goes, so I'm, I'm fasting today, so I'm sorry if I'm not you know, being you know, really clear. Um, and I'm like, wow, this is, this is beautiful. Can I just suggest something to you? You're fasting, and you're seeking God. And God sent us to come pick you up today while you're seeking God. And I'm having a conversation with you about Mashiach, about Messiah, who you've been waiting for for 2,000 years. I want to encourage you to read something out of your scripture, and you tell me what you think of Mashiach. So I turn the the scripture to Isaiah 53, and we're in the van. Again, freeway shut down. It's in park. Seats swung around. AC is on. And this guy is reading Isaiah 53 out of the Bible. And his eyes are opening up, and his mouth is opening, and he's like, I I cannot believe this. I cannot believe this. And I said, "Who, who does that sound like to you? And he said, Yahshua. Jesus, that's how they say it. It sounds like Joshua, Yahshua. And I'm like, and he said, I, I, I must get home and re- he wants to read his own Torah. Like he can't believe that, that our NIV, and I'm like, buddy, it's the same book. They found a Dead Sea Scroll, same book, same scroll, same words. You're gonna go home, you're gonna check it out. We gave him some other ones, but this guy was so blown away. And we had many experiences of sharing Jesus to the Jewish culture. It was really cool over there. So as you can imagine, we were excited about sharing faith. We were praying Israel would come to know their Messiah because they're waiting 2,000 years too long. So that night in the hotel in Jerusalem, fall asleep. And all of a sudden, I think I'm having this dream of everyone yelling out, Messiah, Mashiach, 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 oi, 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 which means come now, hurry, please. Mashiach, 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 oi, 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 oi. And I'm thinking in my dream going, I'm waking up like with a smile going, that's so cool. Like I'm imagining Israel crying out to Jesus. And as I open my eyes, I realize it is a real sound that I'm hearing. I'm hearing a whole bunch of Jewish guys yelling out, Messiah, Mashiach, Mashiach. And first I'm thinking, maybe this is the rapture. (laughs) Maybe the mountains are gonna split it. Maybe this is a place to be. Talk about wait for it, right? I'm in Israel, they are yelling Messiah. I'm like, this is epic, right? And all of a sudden I look out, I'm like, no, it's not the rapture. There's a bunch of guys after a wedding 
and it was like three in the morning, and they're around this table, about 15 of them, and they are pounding on the table at three in the morning, yelling out, Mashiach, 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 oi, 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 and I'm thinking, this is, I would, have, I would have opened my window and yelled with them, but my windows didn't open in the hotel, but it was so cool to see Israel yelling out for their Messiah, and it is such a cool thing that I'm, I, I had to go online, I'm like, where did that song come from? Where did that song come? And I found a version of it online. And on behalf of Israel, how many would like to see Israel come to faith in Jesus in this room? Okay, would you join up and stand me? We're going to play a video, and I want you to join me on the chorus today. It's a little unorthodox, but we're going to sing this out on behalf of Israel because we want everyone from Israel, everyone you know who's Jewish, to come to know who their Messiah is. So if we have that video, if we can roll it, that would be great. Is that cool or what? Some of you are like, I'm not really feeling it. Hey, if you woke up at three in the morning to Israel shouting that song out, and what they are saying in that song, it's, it's pretty epic, they're saying, um, uh, and even though he may tarry, nonetheless, I will wait for him. Here's the lyrics. I will wait every day for him to come. I believe, I believe with complete faith in the coming of the Messiah, I believe, and the chorus is Mashiach, Messiah, come now, Hurry. Come now, hurry. And I just have not seen a group of Jewish people yelling out for Messiah to come in a hurry. And that's why it blew me away. I don't know, do you guys feel any energy in that song? Like something's cool about it? Yeah, I want to bring that back. Can we bring it back again? Let's bring it back. Let's bring it back. Uh, that song needs to come back because there's something epic about Israel who's been waiting. First, they waited 400 years. They did not have to wait the next 2,000, amen? Amen to know their Messiah, and that's what Christmas is all about. And so, um, yeah, so uh, we have a, in fact, there's a graphic of Habakkuk 2.3, the term wait for it. Wait for it was coined by God. Wait for it, you hear this all the time, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Wait for it. No, God coined that back in the day, 1,500, uh, 20, no, probably 2,700 years ago through uh, Habakkuk and um, 2,400 years ago, and so here you have it, though it linger, wait for it, it certainly will come, and it will not delay. And some of you need to know that about the things you're waiting for in your life. If they're promises of God, uh, you need to know. God is saying, though it may linger, he's saying, wait for it. The Holy Spirit's saying, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, and keep leaning in while you wait for it. Don't check out and be passive. Keep leaning in and wait for it. Our next scripture, and this is our last scripture, if you can turn to Isaiah chapter 40, this is an important one about waiting and, and how you wait and what happens to me and you when we wait. Because how many of you guys get a little tired when you wait? 
Can we be honest, right? You get a little tired when you wait. Like, like I've already been waiting, and now I'm still waiting, and now I'm getting a little tired. I get that. The Lord gets that. It's in Scripture that when you and I wait, while we're waiting for it, we can get a little bit tired, and uh, we can get a little bit weary. And this uh, passage says this, and this is out of the, the King James Version on this one here, but you can follow along. Isaiah chapter 40, we're looking at verses 28 to 31, and this is the context is about those of us who are waiting. If you're waiting for something in this room, just like Israel was, this applies to you. So, so take this to heart. It says this, have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths, shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But, but, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They should run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not be faint. And this is the Lord speaking to those of you who are waiting today. You're waiting for something, and you are getting tired, and you are getting faint. And this is a word for you today. Just as Israel waited forever for Christmas, and our kids are waiting for Christmas. If you have kids, maybe you're waiting for Christmas. You're waiting for other things in your life. Some of you are waiting for the return of Christ. You're, we're waiting for things. But as you wait, you get weary. And this is a word for you this morning. You need to hear what God's saying in this context right here in this scripture. Um, we need to know that God's understanding is unsearchable, it says, that his ways, what he knows and what he sees is beyond what we can comprehend through our lens, and that's why his timing is not the same as ours, because he sees way further, and he, he sees the implications of everything far and wide that we don't uh, understand fully. And, and so while why, we don't understand why we are waiting, but God does understand why we're waiting. And, and listen, he gives power he gives power to those who wait. And this is what you need to know. While you're waiting, you get tired and you get weary and we get a little burned out and scripture comes to terms with that. But the Lord is saying, look, even though you're weary, if you're willing to lean in, lean forward proactively with your faith while you wait, God says, I will see that and I will give might to you. I will give you power if you're willing to lean in while you wait. If we continue to wait by faith and don't quit, God will empower. That's what this passage says. God will renew your strength. God knows what strength you have, and he knows when your strength is failing. But if you are believing in the promises of God and you're not quitting and you're leaning forward, God will renew. And that's the beauty of this. He will renew your strength. And it says he'll do it like eagles. Eagles soar way above all circumstance. They take flight above all circumstance. God will renew like eagles. Here's something that eagles do. And this applies to you as a son of God, as a daughter of God. Remember the passage says, at the fullness of time, we became children of God, adopted into his family. This is important. Eagles, when they soar at these amazing heights, so powerful and so majestic, an eagle is actually not defying gravity. It might look like that, and we use the term while well, he's defying gravity. But, but, but as that eagle is taken off and soaring insanely through the air, the law of gravity is still 100% in place. So, so the eagle is not defying gravity. Gravity still applies, whether you're flying through the air or not. Gravity is, well, you don't defy gravity. What, what the eagle is doing is the eagle is applying another law. The, the law of gravity is still there, but the, the eagle is applying the law of aerodynamics. Gravity's still going on, but so is aerodynamics. And because the eagle is applying the law of aerodynamics, he's applying a greater law to another law that's already in place. You guys getting this? If you do this in your life as a son and daughter of God, if you apply God's greater law to the law that you see that's around you in life, you too will mount up with wings like eagle. You will run and not grow weary. You will walk and not grow faint. You will soar like the wings of an eagle who doesn't, uh, is not subject to the law of gravity in the sense that he uses a greater law to overcome it. And the same is true with the kingdom of God and the nature of God and the ways of God. He is giving you things. He's giving you tools. He's giving you faith. He's giving you his word. He's giving you his spirit so that you can be more than conquerors and you can be an overcomer. You don't have to just say, I'm subject to the law of gravity. Of course, not in the natural, in the spiritual. You don't have to stay subject. You could say, God, you have greater laws 
And if I wait and I press in, that you will renew and I will rise up and I will be more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. And if God is for me, who can be against me? And and all things work together for the good who love God. I believe this, God. When you start to apply the laws of God to your circumstance, you're gonna find that you rise above them and you don't become subject to them. And that's what he's talking about, those who wait. Because some wait and get frustrated and say, I'm tired and I'm done waiting. And the Lord's saying, I see you and I know you're tired, but don't be done. Press in, press in while you wait. Be proactive while you wait. The fifth point this morning is this. Don't grow weary in your waiting. Renewed strength is coming. Renewed strength is coming. Don't grow weary. I know we get tired, but don't, don't, don't finally just pull back and, and, and check out and get passive. Renewed strength is coming. Lean in while you wait. That's really, really important. And the last one is this, and this would be great if the worship team comes up. Because what you're doing while you're waiting matters so much. Many of us in this room are waiting for God to do something. And what you're doing in your wait matters monumentally. We've seen people do great things in the Bible. We've seen people strike out. I've seen people in life do great things waiting for God, and I've seen people strike out, and so have you. Just take it in our own hands, ignore what God has to say, and just make it happen on our own. What we do in the wait, it's not just trusting God, it's trusting in his timing as well. That's really trusting God, it's trusting in his timing. But the last point is this, guys, is is while you wait, do these things. Worship, word up, and get rid of distractions. It's the last thing I gotta tell you, while you're waiting, because you're all waiting for something. Worship, when you worship, you, you, you actually spiritually get in the presence of God. And I don't know what you're waiting for, but I can tell you things get a whole lot better when you get in God's presence. I don't care what you're going through in life, what kind of pain, what kind of, when you get into the presence of God, things just change and things just shift. And if you don't know what that means, I would encourage you, discover the journey of becoming a true worshiper. I'm gonna leave that with you as your homework, get with God. What does it mean to be a true worshiper? You can read John chapter four to start discovering what it means to be a a true worshiper. But getting in the presence of God begins to change everything, the feel, the weight, the concern, the burden. And, And so while you're waiting, worship. The next one is be in the word, word up. You get in the word. You gotta be in the word every day, guys. Just like you gotta get up and eat breakfast in the morning, you gotta eat the word. You gotta get in it every day. You can't just rely on Sunday or maybe catch a podcast during the week. That's cool. That's better than nothing. But I'm telling you, God's word is life. It is food. It's nourishment for your soul. And and it will remind you of what's true and what's a distraction and what's not true. So you gotta be in the word regularly. So I wanna encourage you uh, to, to, to worship and word up. And by the way, in the new year, in the new year which is coming, our whole church is gonna be on a, a Bible reading plan and it will be in our church app. You'll be able to open it up and we'll be all reading together, sections together. And this way we could all just kind of be eating a lot every day. If you skip days, don't worry, just jump back in and let's, let's just commit to being in God's word this year, like really being in it. So, so while you wait, worship and word up and get rid of distractions. There's people and places and things that will pull your eyes right off the prize. They will will pull you the wrong way. They will direct you the wrong way. You you pull your focus off of God, and instead of waiting for God, you will do what the Israelites did. Well, I already waited, so now I'm gonna do this instead. And I think the Lord would tell you this morning, get rid of distractions as well. Ask him what the distractions are. We're winding up a year here. Ask him what the distractions are in your life, and put those aside. And as you become a worshiper who gets in the word, you're gonna wait, leaning in with clarity, and the promises of God, I believe you're gonna see them fulfilled in God's beautiful timing. You'll be ready for them and you'll be doing your part and you'll be well positioned for God's blessings in your life. I just wanna close in prayer this morning, ask God to seal some of these things uh, in our heart and um, let's just ask him right now to do that. Mighty God, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of it. Uh, We know waiting is hard, God. Israel waited. Uh, We pray for the rest of Israel that's still waiting for the Messiah, that they would know that you came 2,000 years again, and they would be liberated from the law, as it says in Galatians, and they would be adopted as sons and daughters into your loving family through what Jesus did. That's the only way to, to be adopted. Your word says, to as many that would receive him, Jesus, to as many that would receive him, to them he gave the right 
to be called sons of God, daughters of God, children of God. And so we know it's through Jesus and Jesus alone that that happens, and we thank you for that, Lord. I pray for everyone in this room, Lord, that you would show us how to wait as we lean in, trusting and believing. I pray for those who are weary, God, that you would bring a renewed strength as the eagle uh, seems like it's defying gravity, but is applying another law of aerodynamics that we too, God, would apply your laws to our life, that our circumstances are very real. We don't ignore them, they don't go away, but we apply your promises, your ways, and your will, and, and the word and the spirit, and we take flight over these things, and we rise above circumstance, because you say we're more than conquerors. So let us wait like we are your sons and daughters. Let us wait as children of promise. Let us wait, God, as we expect and lean forward, trusting that you're going to break through. You're going to break forth like the noonday sun, as it says in Scripture. You're going to come. You're going to come, and you're going to bring a blessing to your people, God. I just pray that specifically in this Christmas season, and that you'd be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen. Amen, amen guys. So, uh... This has been a presentation of Valley Metro Church. To hear more messages or to support future podcasts, please visit us at valleymetrochurch.com.